Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction. So uh, first of all, I would also would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to return to my former institute, which embraced me for almost five years of study. So let's begin with the, with, with the talk. Uh, I should remind you that this, this is a joint work with uh, Yair Hartmann and Omer Tammuz. And uh, my talk is mainly interested in extending two classical results of ergodic theory to the setup of group actions. So by group actions, you should understand like large groups, no, not, not uh, Z, not ZD, not amenable. So let's just uh, remind the classical results which we are trying to, to, to extend. And uh, let's say that you have this measure preserving transformation, which preserves a probability measure. And you assume it is ergodic, OK? So whenever you consider a subset of x, then you have by Poincare, Poincare recurrence that almost every point returns to this set. And because of this, you can define an induced map, which is exactly the position of the first return of this point to A. And that is a fact that if you, if you get this measure new and normalize it, then you're going to have, again, a probability measure preserving system. So this is, this is what I call by inducing. You consider a subset, and you, de and you induce a new transformation. OK, so on this setup, we have a few information about TA. So the first one is given by Katz formula, which says that if you consider these times that you return to A, on the average, this time is going to be 1 over the measure of the set. So it's in accordance with what you expect. I mean, whenever, if you consider a smaller set, then the return time on the average is going to be longer. It's going to take longer to come back. So this is the first result we are trying to extend to the, to the setup of uh, group actions. And the second one talks about uh, the entropy, the entropies of these two maps of TA with respect to the measure nu A and of T with respect to the measure nu. And this is given by Abramov's formula, which says that there is an easy relation between these two entropies, and their quotient is exactly the average return time, which, in view of Katz's formula, is nothing but 1 over the measure of the set times the initial entropy. You didn't say, you're assuming you're now. Yeah, I have, uh, I have here ergodic okay. probability. Okay. Yeah, it's always ergodic. OK. So, as I said, the goal of this talk is to extend these two formulas to, to general group actions. OK, but we, first of all, we have to understand what is recurrent on the setup. And we have to understand what should be the, the induced map on the setup as well. So as I said, it's group action. So let's say what is a G space. What, uh, how, how does a group act on a space? So in this talk, G is going, is going always to be a countable discrete group. So you should see, as, uh, for example, as the free group of two gen generators. OK, and you consider a compact, a metric compact space, and you say that x is a g space. If, you, if g acts on the space in other, continuously, in other words, you have a, a map from the product of g with x that maps to x and preserves this group structure of g in the sense that g8 of x is nothing but you first apply h of x, and then you apply g to this h of x. OK, so this is what we call by G space. And we are interested in the actions of, uh, of these groups on, on these compact metric spaces. So this is just a, a, a drawing that uh, you consider a subset. So you have many ways of uh, iterating this, this subset. For every element of the group, you can apply the, the, the element itself to this subset and get another subset of x. OK. So very good. So invariant measures, as a, in, in the classical setup, we have uh, always invariant measures. I mean, when you consider. Huh? Uh huh. The, I mean, you you, you have the, the the topological the topology of the group itself. The topological group, which is discrete. Right. 
Yeah. Which is countable and discrete. Okay, so, so we can ask for invariant measures on this setup. So it's, it is going to be an invariant measure if, it's preser if it preserves the measure under the action of every element of the group. So you, for every G in G and every measurable subset of X, the measure of the image of A under G is the same as the measure of A, okay? So in the classical setup, we know that we always have a measure which is invariant and ergodic theory deals with the situation of uh, invariant measures. So this is the, like, the ideal world that you, that you have these invariant measures, but when you consider big groups, there is no ideal world. I mean, there are examples, for example, of the free group acting on a space of sequences that you don't have uh, any invariant measures for the situation. So what is the natural structure? What is the natural measure structure that you should consider here? And I mean, we, we should change the perspective to something which englobes the, the examples that we are trying to deal with. And this notion is that of a stationary measure. So instead of looking for an invariant measure, you look for a measure which is invariant on the average. And by this, I, I, what, what do we do? We have, to, we have a big group, so we have to, to give weights to the elements of the group to say, okay, with probability one half, I'm going to apply this, this element of the group. With all the probability, I'm going to apply this other element of the group. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that when you consider this setup, you should also equip G with a probability measure. So you have now not only the group, but the group and the measure. And on this setup, you can say what is a stationary measure. Nu is going to be mu stationary if the convolution of uh, the probability measure on the group and the probability measure on the space is equal to the probability measure on the space. And what do I mean by invariant on the average? I mean that if you can rewrite, you are able to rewrite the left-hand side to be equal to this. And so stationarity means that for every set A, when you consider nu of the, the action of the elements of the group in the, in, the, in the subset and you average under this probability measure mu, then you recover the initial measure. So that, that's what I mean by invariant on the average, okay? So just a notation, I'm going to call now this pair G mu stationary. So this is the first uh, change of perspective that, that we consider. We change from invariant measures to stationary measures. Okay, but uh, what about inducing? How, how do we induce? We have, we have a group, we have many ways of iterating points. Ah, so I, I, I should just remind you that uh, now, just like in the classical setup, this, this uh, stationary measure always exists, and you can apply, just like in the classical one, a krilov bogolyubov argument with respect to the convolution with mu, and you are able to prove that nu always exists. So we, we are in good setup. We always have such, such measures. These measures, were, I think, were first introduced in the ergodic theory by Fustenberg on his study of harmonic uh, functions in uh, same simple Lie groups. Okay, but this is uh, another thing. Okay, so the question that I just said, it, how, how do you induce now the action? I mean, you have, you have many ways of iterating a point. So you could apply G1 of X and then G2 of X, G2 of, on G1 of X and then G3 on this, on this point. So we have a problem because this random character says that we have many ways of iterating. I mean, when you have only one transformation, you can do nothing but iterate under this transformation. But here we have a lot of transformations. So what do we do? We change the, we change the perspective again. Instead, instead of looking on the inducing on the set, on the X, we look at recurrence on the group itself because you have a group and you have a measure. So you have a group and you have a measure. So whenever, whenever you consider a subgroup of this group, of course the subgroup acts naturally with, with the restriction to the, to the space. And uh, we are interested in recurrence subgroup, subgroups which are those for which, I mean, I said, you have, a you have a group and you have a measure. So you have a random walk defined on this, on this group, which is at every step, you choose according to the probability mu, 
which increment you are going to consider. So in this situation, you can define a subgroup as recurrent if this mu random walk is going to hit gamma almost surely. So this is the other perspective that, uh, that we change. Instead of looking at the, let's say, the, 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 the space, the phase space, you look at the maps which are, which are acting on, the, on this space, and you, in some sense, you try to, to get, to recover what G has. So that's why we have to assume recurrence, because at some point you have to, to, to go back to gamma. And this is the, the recurrence that we are looking for. So just to give you an example, we consider the free group with two generators. And you have to consider a measure on it. So the measure is this one. So it says that at every step, you choose with uh, probability 1 over 4. Either the increment is going to be A or A minus 1 or B or B minus 1. So this is the Cayley graph of, the, of this group. So we, just like I said, you begin at the identity and with probability 1 over 4, you go through one of these branches. And then you are in a new point and you begin doing that again. I mean, you have four branches to each point. So with probability 1 over 4, you choose one of these branches. So in this situation, for example, I can give a very simple example of a, of a recurrent subgroup, which is you consider the, the even subgroup is the subgroup which contains all, which is formed by all the words of F2, which have even length. So what happens if you consider the random walk that starts at E? Well, after two steps, you either come back to the identity or you are at a word of size 2. So for sure, this, uh, this mu random walk is going to return to gamma, and gamma is a recurrent subgroup. Sub, sub so the second example is, is uh, more interesting. So if you consider again this, this group, and you consider now gamma as the commutator of F2, so gamma is also a recurrent subgroup. And why is that so? Because you look at the quotient of G and gamma. The commutator makes the quotient become a billion. So the quotient is going to be Z2, and the induced uh, measure by the, the measure, this measure mu, when you induce on the quotient is going to be nothing but the simple random walk. So you know that in Z2, the simple random walk is recurrent to zero. But saying that the simple random walk is recurrent to zero in the quotient space is the same as saying that the random walk itself is recurrent to gamma. So you have these two nice examples. And they are different in the, in the, in the sense that uh, here, you always return after two steps. So for example, the expected time to return to, to, to the subgroup is finite. But here, it is a fact of probability that the expected return time of simple random walks to Z2 is infinite. So we have this dichotomy for recurrent subgroups. OK, so this is exactly what positive and now recurrence means, that if you consider the heating time of this mu random walk to gamma, then we say gamma is positive recurrent if the average of these heating times is finite, which is exactly the example number one, and now recurrent if the average is infinite, which is exactly the example number two. OK? Good. So now we have a way of defining the induced adduction. I mean, you have this recurrent subgroup. And because the random walk hits gamma almost surely, you can look at the distribution of the heatings, of the positions of the heatings. So in other words, you can push forward the measure mu to a measure on gamma, which says exactly the distribution of the heatings. So this is called uh, the heating measure of gamma. And it is natural in many situations. And later, I'm going to show you a theorem and that is going to, to, to guarantee to you that this is the right measure to consider on recurrent subgroups. And this theorem is exactly this one, is that whenever you have a stationary space and you consider the action of the subgroup, if this subgroup is endowed, is, is equipped with this theta measure, this heating measure, then, uh, then the stationary space is, is also going to be stationary with respect to the induced one. So it's exactly the same setup as in the beginning, that whenever you consider a measure preserving 
system and you induce, it is again measure preserving. So here, whenever you consider a stationary space, the induced is again stationary. Okay? And uh, just to, to give a rough idea of this, uh, the reason of this theorem is because stationary is uh, intim intimately related to harmonic functions on the group. And whenever you have a recurrent subgroup, the harmonic functions of the recurrent subgroup with respect to this heating measure are exactly the harmonic functions of the group. And then you, using this relation of stationarity, you can prove this theorem of Fustenberg. Okay, so now I can, uh, we are able to state the results. Remind you that we changed the perspective in two ways. The first of all, we consider stationary measures instead of invariant measures. And the second one is that we look at recurrence not on the space itself, but on subgroups of your group. And the first one is Katz formula, which says the following. Okay, you have this group and you have this subgroup. So what, this recurrent subgroup. So what's the expected return time of a random walk to the subgroup. And it's given by a simple formula, and it's exactly the index of the subgroup. So in some sense, if the subgroup is thinner, then this index is going to be larger. Then this means that the random walk is going to hit the subgroup on the average at a longer time. And uh, I mean, in accordance with the classical result, this is exactly what we were looking for, because the expressions on the right-hand side, they, they represent the fraction that the subsystems occupies in the system. So that's why we call this a Katz formula, because it has the same flavor of the, of the, of the original Katz formula. OK? So how much time do I have? About uh, 10, 13 minutes. 13. OK. So I'm going to, to give a rough idea of proof. And how, how, it, how it goes, you consider the random walk on G. And OK, this, the subgroup gamma is not normal. So the quotient is not group itself. So the, net, the natural way of doing was to induce a random walk on the quotient. But it's not a group. But nevertheless, I mean, you can consider the projection. And this projection, instead of being a, a, a random walk, is going to be a Markov chain on this quotient space. And this Markov chain has uh, remarkable properties, which are it is time independent, it is reducible, and it is doubly stochastic. So, and of course, if you consider the heating time of the subgroup, it is the same as the return time of the of this Markov chain on the cosets to the trivial coset. Whenever you return to gamma, the trivial coset, it means exactly that you are returning to the subgroup upstairs. So you are, you are done if you can uh, calculate the expectation of the return time to the, the trivial coset. And because of these properties of the Markov chain, Katz formula says that you have a stationary measure on this setup. And the stationary measure is given by, uh, it gives equal weights to every element of the, of the quotient space. And because of this, we conclude the result. So this is a very rough idea. And uh, OK, a, a, a natural, a nice consequence of this, of this Katz formula is that now you can identify exactly who are the, the positive recurrent subgroups. And by the result, they are nothing but the subgroups with finite index. And that another thing which is interesting is that these guys, they do not depend on the measure. I mean, in principle, you could consider another measure mu on the group and ask, OK, what are the recurrent subgroups for one measure and for the other? And in principle, they could be different. But the, re the corollary of this, of this Katz formula says that they are not. They are the same. OK, so OK, we have uh, halfway done because we, we, we got uh, a natural way of extending the results, Katz formula, to this, to this setup. But what about Abramov's formula? What is Abramov's formula again? Is that formula that relates the, the action, the, trans, the entropy of the transformation, with the entropy of the induced transformation. And to, to, to try to extend this Abramov formula, first of all, we should uh, say, what is the entropy? And uh, there is a, a notion, I mean, it's 
one notion of, of entropy which is given by which was given by Fustenberg, and it's a, like it's a it's a low level let's say definition of entropy that it basically measures how far is the action from being measure preserving. So you have your measure nu. This is a ugly formula, but you could see as the following. This integral here is measuring how much this element g minus 1 is distorting the measure nu. For example, if, if g minus 1 preserved the measure nu, then this hadonic order derivative would be equal to 1, minus log of it would be equal to 0, and this number here would be equal to 0. I mean, it means that you are not distorting your measure. So what we do, we consider the average of these distortions. The average is nothing but to sum over the, the, the weights of the, that the measure induces on the elements of the group. Okay, so in terms of information theory, this is nothing but the, this integral here is nothing but the kullback leibler distance between two measures that one is uh, absolutely, absolutely continuous with respect to the other one. So it measures, so you should see this Fustenberg entropy exactly as a quantitative, quanti quantitative way of measuring how far you are from the ideal world, I mean, for the, for the situation of measure preserving. Okay, so we have this, uh, this notion of entropy. Okay, so now we have the group acting on the space, and this, this group induces, uh, gives you a value of entropy, and you have the subgroup, and it also gives a value of the entropy. And what are the relations between these two entropies? So it is given by Abramov's formula, and it says that here I should uh, remind that we put an additional condition that we don't know, we don't know how, what to say about uh, no recurrent. We only know what to say about positive recurrent, and this is exactly this, this is exactly Abramov's formula, which says that the entropy of the induced one, that you could see like a, as a, an acceleration of the, of the original one, is the original entropy times the expected return time. As I, as, I, as I showed in the first theorem, in Katz's formula, the index is nothing but the expected return time. So it's exactly, again, the same formula for the classical situation. Okay, so I'm going to give an idea of the proof, because I think I still have some time. Okay, I'm good. And, okay, we just rewrite this, this entropy. We call it H mu, and it's this formula. It's an average of the kullback leibler distance between the the measure itself and the push forward of the measure under an element of the transformation. And we just call this guy DKL to be equal to phi of G. That's just a notation. So we have a map defined on the group. And the, the, the good thing is that phi is nearly harmonic. And what do I mean by this? I mean the following. If I consider a point G, let's... Uh, And I consider the very different ways that I, that I have, that I can do to, to, to iterate this, this G, to, to go forward on the mu on the walk. So it means exactly that with probability mu of G1, I am at the point D G1. So I have many ways of walking here. And the notion of harmonicity says that if I average these values here, I would get the value of phi of g. So if you take out that h mu over there, this average here being equal to phi of g means exactly that the function is harmonic. But in our situation, this phi of g uh, is nearly harmonic, is that you are adding a constant value whenever you average along a point, along a, an element of the group. And this property follows directly from stationarity. I mean, it's easy to check. Okay, so the good thing would be if it, if it was harmonic, but it's not harmonic, you are adding this guy. But anyway, we can induce a martingale process here, which is nothing but, you can, this, I remind you, Zn is the 
position n of the mu random walk on the group. So I could just evaluate phi on the position n of this of the of the random walk, and to subtract n times this additional term here. And it's an easy matter to check that uh, this m n here is a martingale. So if it was uniformly bounded or the increments of the martingale were uniformly bound, bounded, we can apply the optional stopping theorem. And the conclusion that we get is that, OK, m0 you can check. I mean, phi of 0 is 0, n is 0. So m0 is 0, the 0 is the expectation of m0. By the optional stopping theorem, I mean, tau is the heating time to gamma. So it is a stopping time. So you can apply, so whenever you average the value of this martingale are along the stopping time, the average of it is the same as the average that you began with. So you have this equality here. But what is m tau? m tau is phi of z tau minus tau times h mu. And this first guy here gives you exactly the average of phi, but not under, under mu, but under the heating measure. So it gives you exactly the entropy of the, of the induced action. And this, the second term here, h mu is a constant. So you take h mu out. So it gives you the expected time times the entropy. So in this situation, if this guy was uniformly bounded or its increments were uniformly bounded, you would have directly that the formula holds. But in general, it's not. In general, I mean, for example, if mu has full support, then uh, this guy, oops, this guy here are, don't, don't, don't have this property. So we cannot apply directly the optional stopping time, stopping theorem. But we can do something similar, which is, I mean, you look at the error term on the optional stopping theorem. And it gives you an expression. I mean, I, I won't go into details, but gives you an expression that in some sense says that how much time can you avoid the, the zero coset on the quotient space. And because this quotient space has finite number of elements, you can apply the machinery of Markov chains to, to, to get that this integral is going to converge exponentially to 0. And it, this means that the error term on the optional stopping theorem is 0. And because the error term on the optional stopping theorem is 0, you can conclude the same thing here, and you prove the theorem. And just to, to finish the, the, this talk, I'm going to give you a corollary of this, which is the following. I mean, now we forget about, uh, about the stationary spaces. We just look at the group and the, and the measure. And this group and this measure, they, they, they induce what is called the random walk entropy, which is some quantitative way of, uh, of measuring the rate of escape to infinity of the random walk itself. I mean, if you consider F, F2, you have many ways of going to infinity. You have some speed, because you could be, you could be applying to your increment a guy that's coming back. And this entropy, which is also called the Alves entropy, it measures this rate of escape to infinity. It is also nice because it has relations with harmonic functions. It is a result of Kaimanovich and Vershik that says that if this random walk entropy is different from zero, so you have harmonic functions on the group which are non-trivial. I mean, you always have constant functions which are harmonic. And whenever this guy here is different from zero, it, this guy here being different from zero is exactly the same as saying that there are non-trivial harmonic functions. And a corollary of the res this result is that whenever you are in the situation of positive recurrence, which by the first theorem sa is saying that you have finite index, then the Aves entropy, the random walk entropy of the subgroup with respect to the heating measure is exactly the initial random walk entropy times the index. So the, the, the way you prove this corollary is that is also due to Kaimanovich, Kaimanovich and Vershik, is that there is a special stationary space, which is called the Poisson boundary of the group and the measure, that this space, the entropy of this space, is exactly the random walk entropy. The random walk entropy is the, the, the maximum of these values of entropies for stationary spaces. And it is attained by the, the Poisson boundary. And the Poisson boundary of G 
and subgroups of recurrent subgroups of G was proven by Fuslenberg that they are the same. So you can apply the, the previous theorem just to this Poisson boundary and get this corollary as a consequence. So this is uh, everything I wanted to say. Thank you.